Sorry about all that. I don't know if it's the connection or what. You sound, it, you sound great now. We can really hear you. Well, you're good now, Frank. For some reason, today the connection in that room wasn't working. Now, you see this dynamic range. Uh, yes, so. and you're nice and clear. All right, good. Well, then finally we got the thing resolved. All right. So now we're talking about dynamic range. And like I said, if you're looking at outdoor sunlight, it's 17 units. If you look at the human eye, which is an excellent, uh, we can see that it's 14 units. But then when we look at something like slide film, it's only six units. And how we can explain that is, uh, now I got, this. okay. Here is a photograph that was taken many, many years ago in Yellowstone Park. It's two moose sitting in the shade. Now, remember, slide film, we only have six exposure values. Uh, with my naked eye, I can see into the deep shadows across, across back, back here in that deep woods. I can see detail in there. I can see detail on, this, uh, on the moose here. The slide film can't. And if I was to move like three exposures to the dark side, like right here, the slide becomes completely black. If I was to move it two exposures this way, two exposure values, it would appear to be look like this. If I move three exposure values to the right here, it would completely disappear. It would be completely white. Now, digital cameras at that time, this is about 10 years ago, were about 6.6. .6 the uh, DSLRs were about eight. Now, today's digital cameras are a lot better. They have an exposure value range of about 11. But remember um, uh, that an LCD monitor, which you're looking at if, you're, if you have, like I have uh, my iBook here, that only has about nine exposure values. And once again, the older digi digital cameras were about six. Uh, so just to make things a little bit more uncomplicated, we'll look at this photograph I was trying to take of the Boston Harbor. Uh, this is taken quite a while ago. Um, this is sunset. I'm trying to take a photograph. And here you can see that the sky is overexposed, it's blown out, and we have all these deep shadows. Now I use an HDR and, uh, here, well, let's look at this first, this histogram. When you look at this histogram, the histograms will be very helpful. It shows you that it's banging against the right side, which means I have a lot of overexposed pixels here. It's banging against the left side over here, which means I have a lot of dark shadows here. With, there's no detail in those shadows, and there's no detail up here. Now, to get around that, I take another photograph, which I'm going to subtract the light by two exposure values. Now you can see I start seeing detail in the highlights. You can all see that the that the, you also see that the histogram has moved over here. It moved to the left, away from the right side. So now you can see I'm seeing detail. Took another one, which I added. Uh, light by two exposure values. Now I can see detail in the shadows, and you can see once again the histogram has moved away from the left side. And now what we do, we have these three expo uh, these three exposures. We combine them with uh, a program that's going to merge them into a, a single file. This huge file has a lot of data. You can't see it on the monitor. Uh, so the computer program is going to compress it using a thing called tone compression and compress it to a point where I can see it on the digital monitor. And uh, this is what it looks like. This is after you have tone compression. Now I can see detail in the highlights. I can see detail over here in the shadows. And you look at the histogram, it's a nice bell-shaped curve. You can still see it's hitting a little bit over here on the right side, 
That's because I have these bright lights here. So you get a very natural looking photograph. This is what my eye saw. This is what the digital camera could see. And this is what I, what I saw. And what I was able to do with an HDR photograph is take this photograph and make it look more closely to what your eye will see. All right. Now, what essentially we've done, we've taken three exposures and we combined them, the computer program combined them into one program, uh, one, uh, you might say, uh, 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 well, geez, I just, I got a mental, I mean, you know, this is a senior moment. One item and then a, the computer program and then is it gonna compress it down to a file that you can see on your, on your computer. Um, you people that know, how do I get rid, I have a, a over on the right hand side here, I have uh, a strip of, uh, you know, the people who are attending, how do I get rid of that? Click what on the I very do? bottom, Frank, uh, the, where it says chat, and that, that should make it disappear, I believe. All right, well, I, I, I can't. If not, there's, um, there's a little, when I you- I think he's gonna see the, pe the little people there no matter what he does. All right, now I got I rid of it. All right, I okay. got rid of it. The, the I, I figured out how to get rid of it. Okay, I got it. All right, now, let me show you some examples. Here's an example. It's been a long time since I visited the, uh, the grand cathedrals of Europe. My uncle Sam sent me over there in the late 50s. But I did make it out to Johnstown, in a Johnstown uh, Cathedral. And here's a photograph. You can see that we have deep shadows and overblown highlights. I take the extra ex exposures, combine them, and this is what I end up with. You can see the shadows have opened up and you can see now I can see details up here in the stained glass window. You can do this to the Johnstown Cathedral and get this beautiful photograph. You can imagine what you can do to the grand cathedrals in Europe. Uh, here's a sunrise at Kitty Hawk. We're overlooking the ocean and the sun's coming up. These deep shadows, bright highlights, take the extra photographs, combine them and you end up with that. You open up the shadows and you sort of tame down the highlights. And you work on it a little bit more, but to optimize it more, you can end up with that photograph. All right, here's another one. This is just, we're inside the Iron Master's living room over in Hopewell. And you look out the window, it's blown out, and you have all these deep shadows in here. Take the extra photographs, combine them, and now we can see the details inside the room. And you look out the window and things look pretty good out there. Christmas at Longwood. This is what uh, one shot, if you set up your camera, took a photograph of the Christmas lights, this is what you would get. You do an HDR, take the extra photographs, and you combine them, and this is what you get. You open up the shadows, but now we can see the street lights, we, we can see the trees, we can see the sky, and the highlights have also improved. You know, it's... Uh, it's almost like magic. And what it really is, it's HDR. Uh, here's sunset uh, on the Portland Lighthouse. We're overlooking the ocean at the moon coming up, but we got these deep shadows. We got, you know, there's no detail in the moon. Take the extra photographs, you combine them, and this is what you end up with. <clears throat> now we have details in the shadows, and we start to get some details in the moon. Another interesting photograph. This was taken the middle of the day. This is the oldest tree east of the Mississippi. It's, uh, I guess it's a live oak down Charleston, outside of Charleston. I can see we have these blown out highlights and these deep shadows. We take extra photographs, <clears throat> combine them and this is what you end up with. Nice blue sky and we open up the shadows where you actually, if you look very closely, you can see all the live ferns living on the tree here. And to give you some idea of size, 
There was my wife and her sister. Harsh midday light. I was up in a bog trying to photograph some wildflowers. I have these deep shadows and this blown out stuff here. Take an HDR. Now I can get rid of the shadows. You can see the flowers a lot better, these uh, lady slippers. And now you can see uh, more detail. Uh, here's an interesting photograph. This is just a barn door. Take an HDR, look at it, and look at this, look at the difference. Why? Because HDRs will exaggerate texture and contrast. You can see the texture of the store shows up a lot better when you shoot an HDR, just of this barn door. So much to the point that when, if you're photographing something like this in this, this old uh, building down on the Skyline Drive, you, you'll get better texture if you're shooting an HDR. So much to the point that a lot of people will shoot color HDRs before they convert them into black and white. So you want to, if you want to emphasize the texture, use the HDR to emphasize the texture, then turn it to the HDR uh, to a black and white so you can you know, just show the texture a lot better. All right, let's talk a little. That's just some examples just to give you an idea what HDR can do under various conditions. Now let's Excuse talk Frank, about- uh, a, couple, a question before you came in. Um, sure. It was noticed that some of your images had three shots, most of them, but you had one there with five. How do you determine how many you're going to take? Well, we'll talk about that. If you're not sure, shoot five. You know, it doesn't do you any harm, especially since you have a digital camera. It doesn't cost you anything to shoot the five exposures. And then when you go home to process, so you can get, if, you, if you use three, fine. If you use five, fine. Okay, we'll get to that. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll try to explain that. Here, uh, we're talking about capture. And this is what, I'm, first of all, I gave, the, uh, this is a, similar to a program I gave 12 years ago. And sort of 12 years ago, what we were doing, you, you, you almost had to use a tripod. And it was important that you use a low ISO. Uh, we used to use mirror lockup and cable release. You shot an available light and you basically use aperture priority or manual mode, either one. But you have to have a constant aperture, constant ISO, constant focus, and a constant white balance. Be careful, be careful with, white, uh, with ISO that you don't change your camera to auto ISO. If you do select an ISO, you want to shoot at so you have a constant ISO so it doesn't vary. And the only thing you want to vary is your shutter speed. Then you shoot uh, the, the number of exposures. You, you shoot enough to capture the detail in the highlights and the shadows. Now that's, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. And basically check the histogram to see if you, if you how, how well you're doing. And we'll sort of get an idea what that's all about too. Uh, that was, you know, 12 years ago. Today, uh, I, you no longer have to use the mirror op uh, lockup or the cable release because they, today's cameras, most of them have auto exposure uh, bracketing. And uh, you can use the two second timer instead of a cable release. The auto exposure bracketing is you go into the camera's menu and you set it up. You tell it you wanted to shoot, you know, do some auto exposure. And you tell you how many, you tell them how many exposures you want. And then the camera, when you press the shutter, will fire three or five or four, whatever you selected. So you don't have to use the mirror lockup anymore. And uh, you can use the two second uh, timer or uh, even better yet, if you have a, uh, a, a wireless uh, trigger release, that even works better. But the two second timer works just as well. Um, and now since the, the newer cameras uh, have, uh, uh, you know, you can go up to the higher ISOs and uh, they don't have as much noise as they did in the past. So by increasing the ISO, 
you can get the shutter speed up, up far enough where you now you can handhold them. And so now you no longer have to, it's, absolute, it's no longer absolutely necessary. You can handhold. In fact, that photograph of the cathedral I showed you, that camera was handheld. That was not with a, uh, a tripod. But available lights and the aperture prior or Madam, or manual mode, that's all the same. So that gives you some idea of what you have to do to capture a photograph suitable for uh, processing. This is just an example of the fact that if you one of the programs, this is Photomatics Pro, it asks you some questions before you process the photographs. And one of the things it's asking you, if you used it on, if you uh, handheld it, right here it says, have you handheld it or was it taken on a tripod? Uh, this is, all right, let me just, um, this thing showed up. Here's the photograph of the Boston Harbor again. And uh, let me explain what ghosts are. Uh, the, uh, you're taking multiple exposures and takes you time between each individual exposures, especially when you, you know, the old method, when you were using manual mode or apps priority at your set and exposure, and then you were, you took a couple of seconds or a minute between exposures. So if there's people walking through here, each exposure, they're gonna be at a different location. So when you combine them in the program, they're gonna appear like this as ghosts. You see the ghosts here. So, and uh, the present day programs de-ghost the photograph when they process it, and some do a better job than others. Now, how many exposures? This is a question you asked before. If uh, here I took five, why? Because if there's any question, shoot the extra exposures. You don't have to use five if you're gonna process it. We'll show you in a little while how I use uh, these five exposures, or I choose which exposures I want to use to process them. Now, one of the things eventually you'll learn after you uh, get accustomed to using HDR is judging sort of contrast. Let's look at a couple different scenes and see, try to estimate what the exposure value is and then sort of figure out what the dynamic range is. Here we have something with, uh, you know, sort of interior with sunlight beaming through a window. We already oh, looked at one of those. That's approximately, you might say, 14 exposure values. It's a very high contrast scene. I'll give you an example if it shows up. Here we go. Here's an example. This is looking out my front door on a bright sunny day. You can see how bright it is out there. and can see how dark it is on the, on the inside. This time I needed five exposures to make sure I covered that big exposure range. And here's what the, the, you know, the end product was. You can see I have nice detail on the outside, nice detail on the inside of the room. Okay, that's one example. Here we have something else. This night scenes with street lights. Oh, that's probably about 12 exposure values. It's still a high contrast scene. We look at, here's an example, I'm shooting Christmas lights of this house. If I do the, you can see what it looks like. You have very, very dark shadows and very bright lights. We do the five exposures and you end up with this. It opened up the shadows where you can see the detail in the trees and the sky. And you can see uh, it toned down the highlights so you can get nice detail in the highlights here. Okay, now we can look at, you know, Sunny day and a backlit subject, that's gonna be, they're gonna have some very deep shadows and some bright lights. Uh, that's probably a 10 exposure. You probably could still use HDR. You get down to here where we had side lip or front lip or overcast days. Overcast days like down here in the bottom. This is an overcast day. There are no shadows, so you don't have to use HDR. This is a photograph taken of a, a wildflower. This happens to be a, a pink lady slipper opening up. And you can see there are no shadows, so you don't need HDR. That's what I mean by judging contrast. You know, when you have a very, very deep shadows, a very, very bright light, 
It's, uh, it's very, very high contrast scene, and that's where HDR is gonna become uh, useful. Okay, now let's look at this again. Here are the exposure values, and here are sort of the three exposures we take. And we can see that it covers a range of uh, 10 exposure values. That's three exposure at two exposure values each. Three shots at three exposure, uh, two exposure values. Here we have five shots at two uh, exposure values. So we have two more exposures, and now we can see we're covering the 14 exposure values. So this should cover, you know, a very high contrast scene. This is probably the most commonly used, uh, uh, you know, they, they, you know, most of the programs, or most of the time people are using three at two exposure values. Three shots at two exposure. Now the other interesting thing to remember is that when you're using five shots at two exposure values difference, you cover that wide range, but you can still cover that, that same wide range if you take three shots at three exposure values. And I, I don't know why it changed by itself, but uh, crazy things have been happening today. Uh, we'll get there. Here we go. That's where we want to be. You get, uh, so you got the same, you might say uh, tonal range of here we're saying 14 exposure values if you're shooting uh, five shots at two exposure values. Uh, okay, well, that's not the right one we want to look at. This one, we're covering the same tonal range. Three shots at three exposure values as five shots at two exposure values. It's useful because the fewer uh, exposures, the fewer shots that you process, the less likely you are to have artifact. The more you, you process, uh, the longer the time it takes to process that you know, your photographs, and the more likely you are to get uh, some artifact. Okay. Now here's another example of, uh, of a, a good subject for HDR, the covered bridges. On a bright sunny day, you look at a covered bridge, it's dark as heck in there. And you look and everything's, you have these, you know, it's a very high contrast scene because you have these deep dark shadows and this bright light outside. Here's an example of an HDR. Now you can see, you can start seeing detail on the inside. There's more detail in the shadows over here. And also the other thing is, I said it, it has better contrast, a better texture. You can see better texture up here in the clouds and you can see this, I mean, the sky is darker. Uh, I'm just gonna show you something just in case. Uh, this is a halo right here. A halo uh, occurs you know, it occurs uh, under a couple of conditions. One of the things it does occur with HDR photographs at very high contrast edges, very high contrast edges, the, uh, you can see that there will be a halo. There's a, a high contrast edge between the tree and the sky here. And, and then you'll see it a white band here, see the whitish band, that's sort of a light halo. But that's not a bad halo. Uh, when they first started out with these HDR, pro HDR programs, they used to have some terrible halos, but now the programs are getting better. Um, let me just show you something else. This is, uh, well, look at this quickly. This is an interesting series of photographs. What I have taken on, you know, here you can see, Way over here, this exposure, there's no detail at all. And over here, we're starting to lose the detail in the highlights. There's two more exposures right here. They just didn't fit on where I get to the point where I have no detail in the highlights at all. And that's about 17 exposures. Now, if I ask the camera, 
since I'm in this covered bridge trying to take a photograph, I asked the camera, give me the proper exposure. This is what it would tell me, this exposure right here. And this is what you would see. You see the camera's getting, since for majority of this uh, view right here is all in, inside and very little outside, it's really starting to do a fairly good job of showing you detail, but you still have some dark, very, very dark shadows up here. And you can see it's blown out here. This is just screaming for an HDR photograph. So that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna do an HDR. And we're gonna take, uh, this is the, the exposure that the camera said is suggested. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna shoot five exposures. I'm gonna select these five exposures right here and we're gonna process them and we're gonna end up with this. You see, now I'm starting to get better detail on the inside and better detail on these highlights, but still blowing out here. Now this is a Photoshop software engineer tip. The people who develop Photoshop, uh, uh, Photoshop's HDR program the software engineers came up with this tip. When you have a situation like this, where right here you have a very, very bright area in your uh, attempted photograph, their suggestion was to use the exposure compensation and move it to the dark side. Here you can see with my camera, uh, Canon camera here, we're looking on the back and we see this is the, sort of what this exposure the camera recommended. Then I have, I'm bracketing, and I'm bracketing two shots over here and two shots over there. There are two exposure values apart, so there's five. They're telling you to switch it to the dark side. What do I mean by switch it to the dark side? Is this, you can see I switched everything to the dark side by one exposure value. Now, instead of using their suggest the one, I moved it to the dark side. And what we, well, let's look at it here. Here, we're gonna to shift to the dark side. We're gonna shift everything to the dark side. We shift everything over here. And then we're gonna use these five, the process, and when we process, we can see we're starting to get better detail in the highlight side. The white areas over here now have some detail where before they were just blown out. So whenever you're shooting HDR, you're trying to, and it has a very, very bright area like that, or you might say a sunrise, sunset, or as long as there's a bright, a fairly bright, large bright area in your photograph, shift to the right. And a lot of people shoot all their HDRs by shifting it to the right. Now there is also in-camera HDR. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we wasted a lot of time, but Practically all the recent cameras have in-camera HDR and it works and it works well. Uh, what you have to do, you have to go to the menu. I'm just gonna go through this quickly because I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this because I don't, I, I don't use it <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Uh, you go to the menu and then you get into the menu and there's an area in there where it'll tell you how to turn it on. And then you go here and you turn it on and here we are turning it on and then it asks you, what you want to set up, how many exposure values apart, two, three, one. And then, uh, so we set it at two. And then uh, it also, you can set what kind of effect you want. I wanted a natural effect. There's natural, there's, there's vivid, you know, bold, so, you know, there, it, all those, are, you know, surreal er different things. And you can tell it where you want it to just, Take you, when you press the shutter, uh, you know it, it does an HDR for you. It'll take this it'll auto bracket, and then process in camera, and it just does it once. Or you want to do it every time you press the shutter speed. So I mean, not the shutter speed. Every time you press the shutter, if you want to do it all the time, and so it does all these things. But very important is if it gives you the option to save all the image, you say yes. Because you not only want to save your HDR that the camera process, you want to save the original raw photographs. Because if you're not happy with that, that image from the camera, you can always take those raw photographs that the camera took 
and processing yourself outside in a computer. Uh, and the reason why I don't like them is because basically all the cameras, the final product is a JPEG. Not bad, and you may like it, but you, it's, you can uh, work, you get better photographs if you're shooting, uh, uh, you know, raw photographs and process the low, uh, all the raw photographs. Uh, then they're able to get a better image, I think, anyway. Uh, in fact, the other interesting thing is, is that all uh, the smartphones, here's an iPhone, this girl's taking a picture of this wildflower right here, which is actually a white trout lily. And uh, they shoot HDR. If you go to the menu, the settings, you'll see here's the, uh, the photo thing. You go there and it says auto HDR, you can turn it on and off. It, it, interesting story, when I bought my wife her first uh, iPhone many years ago, we went down to the Apple store in Lancaster and had one of the young people over there explain to us how to use, how to use the phone. And when it came to the camera, she says, and you can set up this HDR. She says, I always set it on HDR. And I, know, I was pretty sure this girl didn't know much about HDR. So I asked her why. And she gave me a very smart answer. She said, it looks better. And, uh, She's right, it looks better because it looks more closely to what her eye sees. And that's, that's why she, she's, whenever she uses her smartphone, she always has it set to HDR. And, uh, but I tend to use process my HDR photographs in the, on the computer. I don't use in camera, I rarely use in camera. Why? Because it looks better. It does a better job. Now, let me just give you, we got a couple minutes left. Let me just give you a couple examples of, uh, of programs. Here we're looking at Lightroom. Lightroom has, uh, Lightroom Classic has this HDR program. And here's those five images. Now, I'm only going to take these three images right here and process them. And I'll show you how. Here's this image right here. And here you can see this is sort of where I have a histogram which shows me that, you know, where it's banging up against the right side and banging up against the left side. I have these overexposed uh, uh, sky. I have these deep shadows here. So I'm going to use that one. And I'm going to use the one next to it right here. And once again, you can see now I'm starting to get detail in the sky. You can see I moved away from the right-hand side. The next one is where I'm going to get detail in this. Let me just get now. What the hell happened here? No. Here, here we go. I'm going to get detail in the shadows right here. The uh, so I'm going to take these three photographs and process them. And when I want to do that, I go up here to where it says photos on the menus on the top in Lightroom Classic Photos. And I click on that. There's a drop down menu. And I go down to photo merge. And I click on photo merge here. Then another bolt in the uh, slides out. And you have a couple of different choices. Of course, you want HDR. So you click on HDR or you can just use the keyboard shortcut of Control and H. Anyway, with uh, with Apple, it is Control H. I don't know what the control is on uh, on the Windows uh, keyboard. And you just click on that, and you'll come up with this. You'll come up, and a window opens up. It's going to ask you a couple simple questions here. Is if uh, I have a problem with my trackpad right here. It's kind of sensitive. You just have to blow on it and it starts moving. So let's look back here. This is what we're looking at right here. It's going to ask you a couple of questions. You want to auto align. When you start off, use the auto settings right here, which is auto tone. It'll, it'll set all the, well, you'll see what it'll do. And then it's asking you about, uh, the uh, the ghosting thing. It, since we took it on a tripod, you click on none. 
right? And the other thing that's very, very useful, if you click this thing right here, where it says it's gonna stack things. It's gonna send all these all the results back to Lightroom and it's gonna create a stack. And you'll see what that does. So then you just hit down here in the blue thing, which it says uh, uh, process. And you go on, it's gonna process. And this is what it's gonna end up with. It's gonna give you this photograph right here where you see did a nice job of opening up the shadows it's going to get some decent uh, uh, exposure in here in the skies and some decent detail. And here's where it said stack. You can see there's, this is the photograph we're looking at right here because this is the HDR art photograph, which if you look up here, it's a DNG, which is uh, Adobe's uh, raw, uh, raw file, okay? So, it is, so that's the other thing. We process in a camera, you end up with a JPEG. You process with this program, you end up with a, a raw file, uh, which is, you get a lot more, you, you can do a lot more things with a raw file. If you click right here, what happens, it'll double click on that four right there. And what'll happen is double click on that four and it'll expand the stack. So these are the three photographs that I use. This is the result. And this over here, you can see, this is the develop module. And you can see right here is where it has sort of a, a this is an auto intelligence, an AI sort of thing, where the program trying to decide about what the tone value should be. And then if you don't like it, you say, well, I want the skies a little bit darker. Darker, you can go in here and play around with the highlights or play, play around with the exposure. You can open up the shadows by playing around with the shadows, whatever you want to do. So that's an example of how the program in Lightroom Classic works. And this is what the end result is. Not a bad looking photograph compared to what we started off with. So this is Lightroom CC HDR. It's fast, it's clean, it has no load, no noise no halos, it's photorealistic, which I like, and uh, the merge HDR is a raw file. I, all, I like that, okay? The cons are the deghosting is primitive. It does deghost, but does the other programs do better? And the grunge is not so good. Now, some people like grunge. If you like grunge, like I said, you can come over and slide these things you just play around with the contrast slider. You slide it over to the right. You take clarity. If that's a big one. You take clarity and you just slide it over towards 100. You don't have to go all the way. I did it all the way here just to exaggerate it. And uh, then you take the vibrance and slide it over. You take the saturation, slide it over. And you can see you have your knock your eye out photographs there. Okay? So... Uh, that's how you get the grunge thing. It's sort of, in the past, most of the programs were processed and they come up with a, 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 a sort of an end product that looks something like this. And it was, it was called the HDR look. And that's what a lot of people disliked about HDR. Now let me just go again. So this is what uh, we sort of started off with. Now, here's, a Lightroom software engineer tip. I already showed you a Photoshop software engineer tip. You don't, here's these three photographs we processed. You really don't have to process these three photographs. The only photographs you have to process is the one where we're trying to get details in the highlights, this one right here, and the ones where the one which we're trying to get details in the shadows. We can skip this one as an example. Here we go. So I just selected these two photographs. This one is unselected. And I send that over to get processed by going up here and you know coming down to merge and so forth. And this is, I go over here, and this is uh, where the bolted comes up and asking me these questions. I, and you can see the example. This is, a, this is showing me what it's going to look like. Well, that's what I want. And I hit merge there. 
and this is what you come up. Now it sends the photograph back, and it doesn't say four up here, it says three, because here's the photograph, the finished product, the raw file on the top, and below it are the other two photographs I used to, to get, set to get this uh, end product. Um, we look at it right here. Here's when I used two exposures. That was the finished thing. Look, here's when I used three exposures. There's no difference. And what's the exact, what's the advantage of using two instead of three? Faster and uh, less chance of uh, noise or artifact. And it makes sense because here's, a, you know, once again, the example of the three photographs we use and the tonal values we're trying to, we're trying to cover. <clears throat> we can see there's enough overlapping right here that we don't need this image. We can throw, take this image out and only use the one where we're trying to get detail in the highlights and one we're trying to get detail in the shadows. Just use those two photographs the process for your image, and it works. Now let me just show you quickly. We're, all right, we're, I'm all, I should be done by now, but unfortunately, let me just show you these two programs. We'll go through it quickly. Photomatix Pro was a gold standard for the longest period of time. Uh, you have to use it a different way. I'm in Lightroom. I'm going to send these three photographs over, which I've highlighted. Here we have to go up the file and go down to the plugin uh, menu here. Uh, the plug room actually, so we pick out process in the uh, export to Photomatix Pro and I'll export it and this bulletin comes up, some questions I answer. Then it shows you which three photographs it's going to process and it'll process and this is what you end up with. Now the big difference in Photomatix Pro is it gives you a bunch of, uh, I mean right over here, uh, you know, some uh, uh, some examples some different examples it's uh and uh you can pick out which uh, which you want which one you like better and uh you can see it, it gives you a fairly good looking photograph here we look like i said i'm having trouble with this key i mean this trackpad <clears throat> here's an example of the photomatics one and you can see it sends the program back. It shows you which, which slides it used to process. There was five of them. And it comes back as a TIFF, which is as good as a raw file. And here's the one I got with Lightroom. And actually, the Photomatics one actually looks better. And that's the other thing I want to impress upon you. No matter which one you use, which program you use, the end product, they're all going to look different. Like, the photomatics one looks better, looks different than the Lightroom. But you can take this and optimize it. You can make this Lightroom look more like this by playing around with the skies. So that's uh, sort of photomatics. The last one I'm going to show you is Aurora. Uh, this is what most people now can, or not most people, but all sort of the, uh, you might say, the HDR gurus are starting to consider this one to be the gold standard. Or when you look at, uh, when you go on uh, online and go to your web browser and type in which, are the, which is the best HDR program, you'll find that Aurora ends up pretty much on the top most of the places. This is Aurora. I'm just going to take these five exposures and send them over. You're going to send them over and the program's going to show you which five exposures it's going to use. And then this is the end result. This is the, the uh, you know, the end result. This is the HDR photograph it came up with. Aurora is very, very full featured. It, uh, it allows you, as all these uh, examples down here, you have multiple choices. And over here you have filters, which you can uh, change these filters by playing around with these sliders. You can uh, you know, like increase, uh, you know, the exposure, play around with the highlights, play around with the shadows, 
and then it has a lot of other specialized filters about detail and stuff like that that are very, very useful. So it's a very full feature. It's, it's also, it can be a very simple program. You can see how fast I can do it. I can just send the photographs over, pick out which one I like and click and say done. Or I can sit around here and play around with it and, uh, to my heart's content. I can spend hours optimizing this photograph. And this program allows you to do it. So here's another Lightroom photograph. And this is the end result. You can see all night. In fact, this is almost too good. I should have this a little bit darker so it looks more like the evening. But here's sunrise over the ocean with the moon and the lighthouse. And uh, success increases with experience. And so the idea is shoot more HDR and have fun. So these, these are just some handouts, uh, you know, about H free HDR software, the best HDR software, and Aurora and uh, HDR and the in camera for Canon, Sony, and uh, uh, Light, uh, Nikon. And uh, so this is a handout, I guess, which we could just post this HDR file somewhere. Or if you want it, I can send you a PDF file. This is my email address, and uh, that's sort of it. Except, you know, if you want to find things out, we were we were sort of doing an overlook. We didn't spend much time on detail. I just want to give you an overlook as to what's possible, and basically give you some idea, high idea, some idea how it works. You could go on, uh, use your web browser, and type in which are the best programs. These are the uh, what's this one reviewer thought were the best programs for uh, 2019. Aurora, he thought was his best. Easy HDR, which I know nothing about. The next best, I think, was Photomatics, and the number four was uh, was Lightroom. Uh, All I know is Lightroom was number four, and that Photoshop was like 19. So. And you go on YouTube and just type in HDR. And these are all the YouTube videos you're going to get uh, that will, you know, will show you things about HDR. And we go to Aurora and type in Aurora HDR, you'll get all these videos right here that will walk you through and explain to you how to use HDR. So have fun and enjoy. And uh, I guess that's it. I'm sorry we goofed up. In the beginning, and I had to cut my program a little short there, but that's it. Vince, you still there? I am, Frank. Um, you can un um, screen share, um, stop screen sharing, and then we'll bring everyone back, and you can put your mics on um, um, if you desire. Let me get rid of this here. So up at the up at the top, stop screen share. Uh, we're doing. Yeah, okay, there it's all right. And then um, there we go. All right. Um, and if you want to unmute and ask questions, that would be fine. Frank, I think you did a wonderful job. I'm sorry you had a slow start there, but you, you took off once you got moving. And as someone said, you were in your element and you're, you were flying. So uh, yeah, great work. I probably went too fast, but no, 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 you were flying. Well, you were doing, you were flying like your Eagle. You were doing a great yeah. job. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I don't know if people have questions. I haven't, come up with any others in the chat box. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask you um, um, or make a comment, I guess. Uh, Frank, in regard to the de-ghosting, uh, you, you stated that you don't use it if you are on a tripod. Um, can you comment any more about that? Well, de-ghosting was a big problem. It was not a big problem. It was more of a problem with the older programs. Now, majority of the programs will deghost. When you process it, they go to a deghosting. Anything that's moving, they'll sort of try to take it out. They'll take the deghost out. And uh, they'll use one of those three or five photographs as an example and use that in the, you might say, in their final uh, product. They'll use that uh, to uh, avoid the movement, uh, you know, that and uh, and the ghost that you would get. Uh, 
Right. So even if with you're on the product, uh, product you know, the the sorry. So even if you were on a tripod yeah, it, it, photographing it, trees that were moving a little bit, you would want to de-ghost at least yeah. mild. If you had if you had a lot of movement in the trees, you would want to de-ghost. Yeah. Right. But most of the time you're far you know, when you're doing landscapes, you're usually far enough away from the trees that the, the you know the movement is going to show up. But if you're up close, uh, you know the the, uh, the I guess the example I should show is uh, is Photoshop, where they actually do a pretty good job of you know deghosting. If you took five shots of an ocean wave coming in, the wave is moving while you're taking those five shots, and then it'll end up being, it, you know, it, it 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 would end up being a blur, you know, in the final product. Except Photoshop will, they'll absolutely ask you which photograph you want to use in the deghosting process, and you select that, and then. It'll, you know, that's the one that will give you the, the final product, which show you the wave and that the photo that came from the photograph you picked. You understand what I mean? So that way you wouldn't have a blur. You would have a, a very, uh, you might say, detailed uh, uh, view or a very detailed image of that wave. Yeah, and unless you wanted creatively to make the waves into a blur, and then you would not deghost at all. No, then you wouldn't deghost. No, then you wouldn't deghost. Right. Right. Uh, sky cloud yeah. mode is also uh, an indicator to consider deghosting. Right. If you have a lot of clouds moving that day and they're moving fast, majority of the time it doesn't make a difference. Because if you're doing auto exposure bracketing. Those three or five shots are gonna go off fast. I mean, that fast, that you're not gonna have any long interval between each individual photograph. Back in the old days, where you had to use, we had to lock up your mirror and all the other stuff. There was a long time between the individual photographs. That way, you know, you got a, you, you, you got a more an effect from movement in the photograph. I wonder if others have experience with different programs. Uh, I. In addition to the ones you mentioned, I've been using the Nick collection by DxO uh, out of France. Uh, their HDR, it's really pretty fantastic. I um, yeah. And uh, what That's, I have found right. is, uh, if it's a special image, I'll process it in HDR in the uh, the programs you've mentioned: Lightroom, Aurora, uh, Photomatics, and uh, uh, DxO. Um, and the results are very different and also non-predictable. I haven't been able to figure out which program gives the best result for the best combo of images. Um, um, they, are, they are really, they do work differently the way they tone map. Um, right. And my favorite right now happens to be the DxO. I think it. Yeah. Well, in fact, they just uh, talk about DxO they just moved the Nick collection. Uh, they just, uh, I didn't realize, I don't know if you know, they have an upgrade now. It's Nick yeah. Collection 3. Yes. I, uh, in fact, they have, uh, I guess, a sale on today, and I guess it ends tonight, yes. ends, uh, on the 30th of, of June. That, you know, I use uh, their, uh, uh, what is it, uh, what is it, uh, HDR FX Pro. I used that program for years. It's a very, very good program. Right now, I like Lightroom because Lightroom gives you the most photorealistic, as far as I'm concerned. That's a, one of the major re reasons I because it's very photorealistic. It's nice and clean and it's fast. And it's it's right there. Uh, I use Lightroom as you know in my optimizing uh, scheme, so it's right there. And that's why I tend to use Lightroom more than I do the other programs. So. Although Anyone I don't have any programs other than those. Go ahead. No one. I, I use the NIC um, and Photomatics. I've tried Lightroom and I haven't ha I haven't had a great deal of success, but I'm going to try it again now that you suggested it, Frank. Well, I'll tell you what, Vince. What is that uh, with Cooper's uh, uh, video? 
Um, the national yeah, Park. that was yeah from the. Why don't, why, don't you, why don't you make sure you post that? Because there is a real expert using the Lightroom program. Mm -hmm. uh, he's from uh, he's from uh, what National Parks at Light uh, at night. Yeah, he has a video on that. He goes into great detail how he uses it, and he it's really now. He goes into great detail. Like I said, today I, I was just giving an overview, but uh, that's that video, which is only about what twenty minutes or something, is worthwhile watching. It's uh, so if you want to learn how to use Lightroom, look at that video and it'll give you some better ideas how to use the Lightroom uh, HDR program. Uh, uh, I make one technical comment about the Lightroom HDR. Um, actually, I find it to be probably the the least good effect at the in the end result uh, of the all, all that I'm using, but um, Frank, you mentioned uh, when you do the setup to go to automatic setting. Just as a technical point, the um, auto setting in HDR. Um, if you click it, you end up with the exact same thing. If you don't click it and go over in the develop module. And um, um, go to the develop module and hit the auto button right. in, in develop, um, which makes it a little, I think, myself a little clearer um, when you're trying to uh, process your image. Um, well, my only suggestion is that uh, you're right, ex exactly what you say is correct. My suggestion to somebody who's just starting to use the Lightroom program is do the auto toning, because then they have a place where they can start. And then when you go over to the develop module, then you can play with the sliders. If you don't, you go over there and you just have a, uh, an HDR, uh, you might say, product that doesn't look much. It, it's it, you, you just don't know where to start with the... Uh, with the you know the which sliders in the develop module, so if you uh, if you use the auto toning, it, it it shows you it comes up with an image that you could then very easily improve. So uh, for I find that that for people who are trying new to the program that that's usually helpful. Eventually they you know when they recognize what the sliders do, then they can they don't have to worry about the auto toning. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, Frank, when you're um, when you're out photographing, what percentage of photos? I mean, I know it really depends on the light and everything else, but what percentage of photos that you take do you choose to go ahead and bracket? Well, this is what I usually do. You know, when I go out and I'm shooting uh, landscapes, I practically auto bracket those all the time. You know, when I used to shoot slides, I used to auto bracket all the time because uh, I so I'm used to auto bracketing. And uh, so now when I'm out shooting, so this way, you know, I'll auto bracket, I come home, I look at the photograph. Sometimes I think, well, I don't have to use this, I mean, HDR, this particular image, because I have one of those images I, I picked. I could just play around the highlight mm -hmm. slider and the uh, you know and the shadow slider and get a very very excellent photograph. Mm -hmm. Others I would look at it, and especially when you look at the histogram, and you find out that uh, you know when you look at the histogram, it, you know it's banging against the right or banging against the left. That you know HDR would work better with that particular photograph. And you sometimes and actually when I'm not photographing, I will look at the histogram and just take a quick glance at it so I can see that I'm not blowing anything out on either side. And if I am, then I will use HDR. And uh, so I don't use HDR all the time. If, I, if I'm if i out photographing wildflowers, it's rare I use HDR, but I even use HDR when I'm photographing wildflowers. So I use HDR a lot, probably more than other people, but not all the time. I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, absolutely, that's great. Yeah, because I, I know with landscapes, you've all if you've got the sky in there, yeah, 
there's there's reason to do that that yeah. bracketing. Yeah. So, I know some people when they go out, they go on a trip and they photograph. They I mean they bracket everything, and then when they come home, they go through them and choose whether they're going to use HDR or not. Mm -hmm. uh, because the thing is, it doesn't cost you anything extra except. You have to have enough storage to store yes. up those photographs. Uh, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, but then you know, you can when you get home, you can choose. You can throw them away, or or use all five, or use all. The, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, if if it, you know, so, if it's an obvious, you know, wide, uh, you know, you know the uh, it, it's it's screaming for HDR because. It's it's that bright and that dark. You have yeah, you know, the shadows are that dark, or the sky is that bright. Well, then I would shoot three or five exposures. Mm -hmm. uh, so let you, me just screen here for one screen. second uh, I would, uh, to follow up, Frank. What just so people are clear, um, can you see my screen now? Yeah. 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 So uh, I just randomly pick two two images and pretend I'm going to merge them. And here's the setting: the auto align. I would use every time, even if you're on yeah. a tripod. Uh, but if you were to click auto settings, right, the computer uh, will decide what to do. If you don't click that, then yeah. when you come back, when it processes it and you come into the develop module over here, you can hit auto and it's the exact same thing as if you had hit auto over here. Okay. So right. they are the same buttons. Right. Uh, uh, and if you did hit auto here in the merge screen, and these have these sliders have all been changed, you can then just, as Frank said, readjust those sliders. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. So, uh, just to, just to be clear, I'll stop screen sharing there. Um, the um, the other thing that you could consider, you can actually process a single image as an HDR. Uh, that's easy to do in Aurora HDR. I'm not sure there's a may I haven't figured out a major advantage of doing that, but it will process as uh, a single image in, into multiple files and then blend them together. And supposedly the guys who write about this say that the end result is a little better than you would have gotten had you uh, had to go really big on your sliders to make your adjustments. Well, I did one of the, yeah, one of the, the, the he's probably right, because one of the things that happened is, uh, uh, how can I explain this? When you take a similar, similar, single image and you're using the sliders, especially the one slider that could be a problem is the shadow slider. If you move it way over to the right mm -hmm. to open up your shadows, you get to a point where you start introducing a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. If you do the HDR, you're less likely to get noise. Mm -hmm. And you can do, you, I mean, you can take a, a, a scene, uh, you know, like, well, just one of the slides that I showed you, like of the, uh, this, uh, the fall foliage shot. If you take that and use those three shots, and uh, do an HDR, you'll find that your shadows will be nice and crisp and clean. If you take the, you can take the, one of those single images and play around with the sliders. You can, you'll be probably, you can do very well with, uh, by using the highlight slider to get detail in the highlights. It'll start looking pretty good. But then when you start getting detail, sliding the, the shadow slider over to the right to get detail in the highlights, you'll get to a point where you'll start seeing a lot of noise. You won't see the noise in the HDR photograph, but you will see the noise when you're playing with the sliders. So what that guy is trying to tell you, if you, in Aurora, yes, you can take a single, single image. And the advantage, one of the other advantages, remember I said you get a, you get a lot of emphasis on the texture with, in HDR. So when you use the HDR program, it's going to uh, exaggerate or improve upon the texture, depending what you want, what you're looking for in the outcome. 
but it's also going to give you a cleaner image in the highlights. That's what he's probably trying to say to you. Yes, and, and to drive that home to me, I didn't, I wasn't quite a believer of the noise with the shadow reduction, uh, with opening up shadows. I had a shot which I really thought was good from Blue Marsh, a sunset. Um, and uh, ISO 100 on a tripod, but I needed, it was not HDR, which it should have been. Um, and um, the end result, the, the, the shadow needed to be opened up. I opened it up, not even two thirds of the way. And it's not printable. Mm -hmm. There's enough noise in that shadow with my Canon Mark III, EOS 5 Mark III, ISO 100. It's not printable at 16 by 20. Because, and I've tried to get rid of the noise and I, it, I have not been successful in getting rid of enough of the noise to make it a well printing image that's big at ISO 100. And that was really, it was, it was quite a disappointment actually that the camera didn't hold on to it. Uh, but I've talked to, I've talked to um, one of the guys at uh, National Parks at Night about that. And his comment was uh, exactly that, that you, you're, it's surprising how much you can lose when you start opening up shadows. So really, uh, if it's more than three stops, I think you need an HDR, Jenny, to go back to your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, you know, the, the NIC um, HDR effects, which you can do on a single image, I usually do that in Photoshop. So I'll create a layer and then apply that HDR effects pro from Nick to that layer. And then if you mat put a mask on there, you can just reveal the, like that texture, Frank, that you were talking about. You can just reveal that in certain parts of the image. And you can also change the opacity of that HDR effects layer so that you are choosing where it's showing up as opposed to applying it to the whole image. Well, okay. Uh, anyone, else, anyone else have any comments? Frank, we've gotten some nice comments in the chat. Um, um, thanking you for a great job. Uh, if you can email me, Frank, your, that last slide with the references, we can get that into the next newsletter with the reference to the National Parks at Night video I sent to you. Right. Yeah, I, I really uh, would like people who are interested in the Lightroom HDR to look at that National Parks video. He does an excellent job. And once again, I'm sorry about the beginning. I, you know, the uh, we tested it the other day, but that was in a different room. And uh, I was trying to get, uh, you know, it was, well, actually, uh, once I moved to this room, it worked out. I yeah. think we solved the problem. It was, for some reason, uh, and this is the first time it ever happened in that room that the uh, the internet uh, I, I was intermittently losing the internet. So I'm confused by your light out there, Frank and, and Jenny. Um, it's black where I am, and why I'm missing. Well, the sky well, is still light behind me. Well, I don't know if you can see back there. I, uh, I can through your big window. Yeah, that's it. Unfortunately, you can't see me. You can't see me and the dog. The dog's laying next yeah, to me. Yeah, you need to be in HDR, Frank. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't do this in HDR. You're right. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Oh, yeah, all right. Thank we'll you see so you. much, Frank. That was really great. I Thank really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Frank. We'll see you. Sorry for the sort of goof up. No problem. Uh, no problem. Thank you. Great, great program. Okay, thank you. Yep, nice job. Bye-bye. Right. See you, everybody. Sure. All right. See Bye, you. Vince. Bye.